Thank you very much. Hi, everyone, and thanks for taking a little break during lunch to hear about Earths in other solar systems. So I'm an astrophysicist at Columbia University where I study galactic dynamics. I study how galaxies collide with each other and how dark matter behaves in the universe. So I'm going a little off topic today because I wanted to relate the talk to um, the space app challenges this year, which is about Earth. And maybe to give a little inspiration of what we're all working about, I was going to talk about are there other Earths out there? Um, and also, just briefly, um, I do talk about many other um, astrophysical concepts in my YouTube channel, Space with Sarah. So if we get started. So starting with our galaxy, this is just an illustration of the galaxy, the Milky Way that we live in. And we can't actually take an image of this. So this is just an illustration that we made based on how we think stars are moving around with the gas in our own galaxy. Because the Milky Way is so big that we can't actually get out of it to take a picture from above. But what you should take away from this in this talk is that the sun is just one of billions of stars in our own galaxy. So our star, the sun, is just a lot closer to us. That's why it looks a little different than all the stars. Um, but it's just one out of many, many stars in our own galaxy. So if we look um, at a real image of our galaxy, this is actually an image taken looking in the plane of the sky. So we're this disk. Um, spiral galaxy is the galaxy we live in. You can see again all these stars and gas and dust. Actually, you're not seeing the gas here, but the dust in this image. And it wasn't actually until 20 years ago, roughly, that we knew that other planets around other stars than the sun actually existed. So we could see in our own solar system that we had planets, so you might think that it's not so odd that other stars should also have planets. But we actually didn't know this until 20 years ago when 22 years ago, I think, was the very first discovery. And now we actually know of more than 3,000 confirmed planets in our own galaxy. And we actually have thousands of others that are just waiting to actually go through the confirmation process. But we know of many, many planets. And it actually seems like most star, it's actually quite common to have a planet. So you would almost expect most of the stars you look at in the sky to actually have a planet or a few around them. So just very briefly, the way we actually detect these uh, planets is kind of fun to think about. So if we just look at a star and look at all the light that we receive from that star, if a planet transits in front of that star, you'll actually get a little dip in the light curve as the planet is blocking some of the light from the star. So you can kind of see this here. If you just look at the screen and the overall brightness, you'll see that as the planet is coming in front of the star that we're observing, you'll see a dip in the light curve. And based on exactly how deep that dip is and also the shape of it, we can determine some interesting things about the planet in a different planetary system. So for example, the size of that planet would, would be an interesting thing to ask about. A different way of doing this is actually looking at a star and how the star is affected by a planet orbiting it. So if you have a planetary system, actually the planets will also be pulling a little bit on the star in the center of that planet. So this is not to scale, but what we are actually seeing is because the star is also orbiting the common center of mass, we call it, we see the star wobbling a little bit due to planets pulling on them. So this is a different way of actually determining the mass of planets. Uh, around, or around other stars than the sun. So these are the main ways we use to detect other planets around other stars. So one other interesting thing to ask is then, is there an Earth 2.0 out there? Have we actually been able to detect something exactly like our own Earth out in our own galaxy? Um, and right now we know of roughly 300 planets that have sizes that are smaller than 1.25 times the size of Earth. They're not exactly Earth analogs. We haven't actually found Earth 2.0, but we're getting closer. And I thought I would kind of elaborate on some of the f my favorite systems that we've found so far in our galaxy. So very excitingly, actually a recent detection is that the very closest star to the sun, which is four light years away roughly, 4.3 light years away, Alpha Centauri C, actually has a planet. Um, and that planet's mass is only, the lower limit is 1.3 times the mass of our own, um, our own Earth. So this potentially, we actually might have kind of an Earth-like planet around the very nearest star in our own galaxy. 
that's very exciting. And I can talk to you more about that later if you want, because there are very interesting missions in how we might go out there. But four light years is quite far away, trillions of, uh, trillions of miles. So it's still a little hard. So if we sent a light beam right now, um, people on that planet would see it four years from now. But that and then traveling there would be a lot harder, of course, which I can talk about more later. So just a friendly reminder that we have these beautiful images from Hubble that actually shows us that there, we just live in one galaxy, right? And actually, if you just stare at kind of a blank, a blank point of the sky for long enough, you'll eventually see all these other galaxies that, of course, also have billions of stars, and now we're pretty confident they also have billions of planets. So this is very exciting. So it's indicating that because we're finding planets kind of like Earth in our own solar system, one should, oh sorry, in our own galaxy, one should very much think that there would definitely be Earth 2.0s in the other galaxies. Although they're very hard to detect um, with present day technology. So what are we looking for when we look for these planets? So we, of course, here on Earth, are familiar with the life that we've found so far. But we don't actually know how this life starts, which is a big problem. But we do know that most, or life here on Earth, likes water, right? So one of the things we go for when we try to look for the most interesting extrasolar planets, exoplanets, is could they have liquid water? And there's a very fine transition here in how close you want to be to your star to have liquid water. So there's just the right region that I'm showing here in green, uh, just as an illustration of we want to find that perfect balance of being able to not be too hot or too cold for life to exist on these planets. And one very recent also detection is this very cool system, TRAPPIST-1, which has seven roughly Earth-sized planets. So actually, really, this is one of the, the systems that astronomers are very excited about because we actually have seven Earth-sized planets. So the difficulty here is we don't know their masses very well, so we're not entirely sure of their composition. But one cool thing is that um, they at least look to be the right size as the star that we know from our own solar system. So one peculiar thing, though, is that all of these planets in TRAPPIST-1, they're orbiting their star very, very close in. And the reason this works and that they could still be habitable is because um, the star that they're orbiting is very tiny. It's only roughly 9% of the mass of our own sun. So it's a very tiny star, um, which means you could actually fit all the orbits of the planets in that new TRAPPIST-1 system within Mercury's orbit in our own solar system. So just so you kind of see the scale that we're operating on. And a few problems with that is that low mass stars are thought to be very active. They have all these solar winds and flares, and that might actually make it quite difficult for life to be sustainable. Because we know here on Earth, we're very much protected by the magnetic field surrounding us, and we're quite far from our star, and the sun is not that active compared to these small stars. But this is still a very cool system um, that has the most Earth-sized planets so far, at least. So a new one that's only just been published in Nature in April this year is this other very exciting um, planet. And this is orbiting a star that's um, a little more massive. It's 15% the mass of the sun. And then furthermore, it's, um, it's kind of, we know, we know the mass of this star and we know uh, the size of it from its transit. And people are very excited because this is quite close to us. It's roughly 33 light years away. So people are excited about probing um, the atmosphere of this planet, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but also we at least know for sure that this planet is rocky. So this is one of the systems now that is getting a lot of attention for follow-up observations and one of the ones we want to study. But it's also, again, this one is a little more massive than Earth. I think they say it's roughly six times the mass of Earth. So it will be one of those super Earths. So again, it's not a perfect Earth 2.0. And then just one of my last favorite systems, because I've been mentioning stars that are a lot smaller than our own sun and planets around those. But Kepler, uh, the Kepler mission you might have heard about was actually, its mission was to go and search for Earth 2.0. So it wanted to find an Earth around a sun-like star. So specifically, it's targeting stars that are more like our own sun. And then again, the problem is we haven't found the perfect match. We found Kepler 22b, and this system is 600 light years away. So it's becoming a little hard to do these more uh, fancy observational studies, for example, of its atmosphere in the future. But it's one of these that are in the right zone that could have liquid water and should be a rocky planet. 
that we might be able to have life on. So the big question, of course, was this, are they habitable? And we heard about, some of you were here yesterday, we heard a few comments about Earth's atmosphere, how actually it looks very, very thin. Uh, the astronauts were telling us yesterday that if you're actually looking down on Earth, you're kind of surprised by this thin atmosphere that we actually have. And this atmosphere is very important for us to be able to live here on Earth. So the new very hot topic in exoplanet research is uh, can we determine the atmospheres of these planets and can we look for biosignatures of life on these other planets? So this is definitely the thing that will really be re revolutionized within the next couple of decades is actually probing atmospheres of other planets around other stars to see exactly if they, for example, could look uh, like Earth. And then the big question, which is a little relatable to some of what uh, you're thinking about here is, um, how do we actually explore these systems? So I've mentioned a few times, they're very, very far away. And it's, it's a little sad because four light years was the closest planet, right? And there, people are talking about very ambitious missions of actually sending something at 20% of the speed of light to go there and take images. But to send humans would still take roughly 100,000 years with current um, spaceship technology. So that's a little disheartening, but in our own solar system, we can of course, <laughs> we can of course uh, study the planets uh, more easily, which is what some of you are working on also in related to the Mars, um, Mars challenge. But I do think the most exciting thing is probably we'll at least be able to say this is exactly like Earth and then start imagining what life might be out there. Um, so just very, uh, my last point actually, is that something I think is really cool to think about is that Earth is only 4.6 billion years old. Our whole solar system is only 4.6 billion years old. But the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So that means that planetary systems could actually exist, for example, in all the other galaxies that I showed you, or even in our own galaxy, where the, the system is a lot older than the one we live in. So that's just kind of a fun question that I'm talking about in my next YouTube video actually in a few weeks about how would civilizations actually have developed if they were formed billions of years earlier than we were, right? So you could start thinking about how intelligent could alien life potentially be. And that's all I had for you today. Thanks for coming. I'll take a few questions if anyone is interested. You can come up to the microphone maybe. I'm not sure it's on. And remember, I'm a galaxy person, so I don't know anything about planets, though. No. <laughs> Very good question. So the question was, if we could send humans at 20% of the speed of light to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. And no, that's definitely not the plan. Right now, we don't at all have that technology. So spaceships are currently traveling at 30,000 kilometers a second. So, oh, sorry. Um, so we can definitely not do that yet. They're talking about sending these nanoprobes, so basically tiny, tiny cameras, and they would be powered by uh, the solar um, photons from the sun, actually. Um, so we heard a little bit about that yesterday also, but I could definitely talk to you about it after. If we were going to do the 20%, how long would it take to get there, those little nanoprobes? Yeah, so then with the nanoprobes only, so a few decades, right? Yeah, but there are a lot of, so we, it's, people are excited because even now if we send it, you'll be able to actually get the information, but there are many details uh, that goes into it of, of if you're flying that fast, for example, we just never have done that, right? And you could hit stuff on the way out of our old solar system. There's a lot of things uh, that they're looking into now, but the, the community is very excited. So there would be the first interstellar travel, which is just amazing to think about. Uh, when you say probe the atmosphere, what do you actually mean probe the atmosphere? Very good question. So what I mean is that if the planet, which I showed you for the transit, if it comes in front of its star, you can actually take a spectrum, you can look at the light you receive from the star without the planet in front of it, and then you can look at it again with the planet in front of it and kind of take the difference between those two observations. Because as you can imagine, then maybe some of the, or some of the light from that star will have been absorbed in the atmosphere of the planet. So we can kind of look at what molecules that uh, atmosphere might exist in. But it's very hard, because remember, the star is so bright. 
yeah, the, the planets are tiny, right? So it's a very difficult observation to do, but people are, are definitely making advancements in that. They're actually able to do it now. Like they can get that tiny little layer of atmosphere and whatever the different, the different wavelength is there. So I'm not entirely up to date on this, but I think there has been a few examples, but I'm not sure how well we trust the data yet. There might be a t too high signal to noise, but definitely people are, are advancing in how we could do this better. So I'm not entirely sure about how many examples we have of that yet. When you talk about scanning for biosignatures, what specific ideas did you have? Like, how would they do that, actually? So I think that's actually based mostly on research from Earth, right? So you would look uh, at our own Earth and what, what we have in our atmosphere, and then you would start to say, just the most simple thing could be, what can we find exactly the same atmosphere? And what might that tell us? So you can look for these biosignatures. We would have biologists involved to answer the question more detail, probably. Yeah, and actually, um, when it comes to these heavier than Earth planets, the super Earths, um, could you make any comment on do you think silicon based life is possible? Great question. So, silicon is one of the very uh, common elements also out there in the universe, and it's very good for it. people have proposed that it, instead of carbon based life, you should have silicon based life because it's also very chemically versatile. Yeah, the, the four valence the four valence electrons. Exactly. So it's great at uh, binding. Um, so again, I'm not an expert on that, but definitely people have proposed that as a different form of life we might sh that we should maybe try to explore more. And your comment on super Earths, it's kind of a fun to think about if you have a much more massive planet, the gravity would of course be different. So humans couldn't just walk there as we do on yeah, Earth. Be, yeah, the gravity would be much higher, much harder to walk, like you said. So I was <laughs> thinking maybe the life would be heavier to compensate. That's a great point. I hadn't actually thought about that. Yeah, definitely. So that would be really cool to think that we should maybe look for biosignatures from silicon life, which I have no idea how we would do at this point. But great point. We'll figure it out. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Together. Hi. So in systems like TRAPPIST, if, if I remember correctly, a lot of those planets are tidally locked. So do exactly. we tend to, to include or exclude those based on how that might affect like the, the atmosphere? Great question again. So the question is, uh, I didn't touch upon that, but actually because the planets are so close into the star and the TRAPPIST-1 system, they're tidally locked. And we know this from our own moon, that we're actually always seeing the same side of moon, the moon as it, as it orbits Earth. The same thing is the case in this system in TRAPPIST-1, where the same side of the planet is constantly facing the star. And that is also a very interesting thing to think about for aliens, right? So you have a day side and a night side that's probably pretty extremely cold and the other is pretty extremely hot. So that again opens up for a whole new question of how would life on that type of planet be, which we don't know. But I think for, to answer your question, it's probably not the best, but I may be just being limited to what we know from Earth, but it seems like not the best uh, way to, to have a life form. But another thing that makes it really cool though is the planets are so close to each other. So people have written papers now explaining that if there were life, it's probably way more likely that that life spread to all the planets that could have life than in our own solar system, because they're just so close to each other. And just a fun fact, that um, because they're so close to each other also, you would actually see your night sky, you could actually see some of these planets looking huge, right? If you're sitting on one planet, it would be a very beautiful night sky of the other planets, because they're so close to you and big. So if we're able to go four light years and actually reach the nearest star, what, what are the chances that we can actually communicate with, um, if there were life forms, or what are the chances we can communicate with them, or would it be more of a data retrieval mission? Yeah, so this one, the question was if we can communicate with life that we might uh, look for. Um, for the first part, the one where we're sending probes to Alpha Centauri, that's to take images. So we could be really lucky and just get images of high skyscrapers and see exactly life out there. That's probably unlikely. But to answer your question differently, we are already ven already been broadcasting radio signals for hundreds of years now, right? And we saw yesterday, I don't know if, um, who were here, but we saw yesterday how the radio signal we've been sending out from Earth ever since we started doing that has actually not re reached a very big region in our own galaxy. Um, but that's one way we're indirectly already communicating, right? We're telling other potential life forms that we are here. Um, but right now, I, I don't know uh, how else exactly. So there's also SETI, which constantly looks for weird radio signals that could indicate intelligent life. But of course, there could also be a completely different life form 
uh, that we just haven't thought of. And if it's just very simple life, they wouldn't have sent um, out any signals yet. Yeah. What problems are you trying to solve as an astrophysicist? And um, like, what are the top research problems or the unmet needs that would help with like greater computational power and machine language programming? Um, that's something I'm just really curious about. Yeah, so definitely a lot of people in astronomy now are very interested in big data from the new surveys we're getting. We're getting tons of data from these surveys that are just mapping out the universe, right? So people are definitely thinking about how to handle that better and work directly with computer scientists to actually do this. And also in classification, we, we could really use this. So you saw the image from Hubble of billions of galaxies, or yeah. there probably wasn't billions of galaxies in that image, but just to have a, a classification system of saying this is a spiral, this is an elliptical galaxy, this is a dwarf galaxy. People are using machine learning for those types of questions now. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. No problem. How do radio signals do over four light years, and how do we expect to get images back from these nanoprobes? And uh, given that, what's the likelihood we could communicate directly to someone four billion, four light years away. So this is something they're still figuring out. The last time I checked, I don't know how they're going to send the signals back to us. But um, they should definitely, if there's life sitting out there on their, their, that planet, they should definitely receive our signals. But from just Earth broadcasting, hey, we're, we're sending out radio signals. But I don't think there's efforts yet trying to directly send something at that planet, a signal to that planet. So they're definitely now working hard on thinking, when the probes get out there, how do we get the images back to Earth? But it should just take for years. Radio, radio waves travel at the speed of light. Uh, yeah, but is it interpretable over that? Because it's not going to degrade too much, where you have no idea what you're looking at? Um, that I don't know. That's a very interesting question. I have no idea. OK, so that seems to be it. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.